Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Mark's Gospel, Chapter 13, where we've been in a series on the Gospel of Mark now for quite some time. And we find ourselves in a mini-series that we've entitled Living in the Last Days. And today, this morning, is the third installment of that mini-series. It's on the end times. This morning, specifically, we're going to be talking about the coming world ruler. And just to set the stage for you quickly, when you come to Mark 13, it is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's been teaching in the temple. He's been confronted. He's been answering questions. He's teaching as he leaves the disciples with him. They marvel at the beautiful uh, temple buildings and, and all that is there, and they comment on that. And Jesus Jesus responds, there's coming a day when not one stone will be left upon another. Matthew's gospel tells us that in Matthew 24 and verses 1 through 3, that the disciples respond by, by asking him this question. They said, tell us, when will this happen? When, when will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're really asking for insight into three specific events. And Jesus answers their question in Matthew 24. We also have that recorded for us in Luke 21, and then here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. We started this series by looking at his answer from verses 1 through 13, and that really covers from the time of Christ up to our own current time. And then last time, I wanted to talk to you about an event that I think is very crucial for our understanding when we're talking about the end times, we're talking about the last days, and it's an event that happens in the white space between verses 13 and 14. It's an event called the rapture of the church, where there is a catching away of the church, where Jesus returns and gathers his own. And honestly, there's no sign left except one for that event to take place. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 and verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony, and then the end shall come. So what are we waiting for? What needs to happen? As soon as the last person on the farthest reaches of the globe has had an opportunity to hear the gospel, the end will come. In that sense, we are closer than we have ever been in seeing the gospel advance. What's left? The gospel goes out, and as soon as the gospel's gone to the ends of the earth, the end comes. And that end is triggered or announced by an event called the rapture, the catching away of the church. As we saw last time, Jesus comes and seizes all of those who are alive, who are Christians at that time, as well as resurrects the Christians who have died, resurrects their body. We are gathered up to meet him in the air, and so we will ever be with the Lord. That then inaugurates, if you will, a seven-year period known as the Tribulation. It is a time of calamity. It is a time of unparalleled demonic activity. It is a time where literally everything is shaken that can possibly be shaken with one cataclysm after another, and we'll be looking at some of that next time that we look at Mark's Gospel. When you come to verse 14, though, and Mark chapter 13, we're at the middle of that tribulation, that seven-year period, that final seven-year period from the time of the rapture to the time of the return of Christ when he sets up his earthly kingdom. In the middle of that, there's an event that happens that the Bible talks about on more than one occasion. Let's begin reading in Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. But... When you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Would you notice when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he, not it, he, ought not to be? Let the reader understand. 
Matthew offers some clarification in verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, that's in the temple, which leads many to speculate that what Antichrist will do is he will be such a unifier, such a uniter, that he will, such a, a gifted orator and communicator and and able to bring people together that he will create the opportunity for there to be a Jewish place of worship. And it'll be at this place, this temple, that something happens. Notice it says, when you see standing in the holy place, that's the temple. The abomination, what is a, a, abomination? The sacrilege, the thing that's abhorrent to God the thing that is blasphemous to God. When you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Three times Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation, and from Daniel, we learn some things about that moment, about that event. One of the events we'll look at in Daniel happened 200 years before the time of Christ. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But it's important to understand because there are some people who say, yeah, all of that is historical. All of that has already happened. Not so. Clement, one of the early church fathers in 80 AD, expected or saw what Jesus says in Mark's gospel and in, in uh, Matthew and Luke's gospel, he saw that. The early church fathers, after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, he saw it as future. So let's look at it in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Here it's talking about the Antichrist, this one world ruler. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, and we don't have time to look at it, but that seven is a seven-year period, the tribulation seven years. He'll confirm a covenant with the Jewish people for seven years. And in the middle of the seven, so three and a half years in, in the middle of the tribulation, at the start of what is known, that last three and a half segment is known as the great tribulation, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In Daniel chapter 12, we read this in verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days, approximately three and a half years. We read this in Daniel chapter 11, and here it is dealing historic, historically with an event that happened in approximately 170 B.C. There was a Syrian ruler named Antiochus, and he came with a quarter million of his men. He had attacked Egypt. He was driven back, repulsed. He came back to the area of Israel, Jerusalem, and he went into the temple there, and he slaughtered a pig on the, the altar in the temple. And he established an altar to Zeus, and he gave himself this name, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus God Manifest. And he becomes, at that point, a prototype of the Antichrist. Notice it says, then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Jesus says in Mark's gospel, when you see that happen, let the reader understand. Jesus says, when you see that happen, when the one world ruler is ruling, and you see him do that, there are some things that that introduces. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to back up a little bit and talk to you a little bit about what the Bible says about the Antichrist. One of my concerns is in the contemporary churches that you don't hear much of this kind of teaching, certainly not on a Sunday morning. And what happens is so many, especially I would say younger preachers, have a tendency to believe that because you can't know everything, you can't know anything. 
that because there are some things that we just don't understand, it, it causes people to say, well, you can all figure that out. We don't know. It's all going to work out in the end. The Bible says much that we can't understand. I think it's important for Christians to understand it. So what I'd like to do is just kind of take a jet tour through the Bible and talk a little bit about what the Bible says about this coming one world ruler. The, the world, as all of us understand, would welcome somebody who could stop wars, dissolve religious tension, could in many respects, relax borders in a way that wouldn't sacrifice identity, but would help people to be able to trade, that it, that would usher in. If you didn't have the wars, and you didn't have the religious tension, and you had the free flow of goods and commerce, it would usher in a time of worldwide, global economic prosperity unlike the world has ever known. And the world would welcome that. Jesus is saying that day, the Bible is teaching that day is coming. The term Antichrist, oddly enough, is only found in 1 John chapter 2. We see an example of it. It's mentioned four times in Scripture. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come. I think it's very possible that because Satan doesn't know the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes, he's got to constantly have somebody waiting in the wings that he can push forward to take advantage of the opportunity to lead the world. So there are many antichrists, but ultimately there will be one antichrist. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, here's how he's introduced. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of seven seals. This is the start of the tribulation. Then I heard one of the four living creatures, an angelic being, say in a loud voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a white horse, and its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. This then is both the Antichrist and his kingdom. This is both the, the ruler and the fact that he has a political system by which he rules, and he comes as a knight in shining armor. He comes riding on a, riding, excuse me, on a, on a white horse. Say that five times real fast. He's a deliverer. He's a consummate problem solver. He is winsome. He is charismatic. He is powerful in both word and deed. And no doubt he comes in and dissolves religious tension, as in some ways he's probably all things to all men, quoting Muhammad and Jesus and Krishna and every other influential religious person who has ever lived and somehow bringing everybody together because he is, in the mantra of our age, spiritual without being religious. And he comes. What will he be like? What I want to do is I want to give you just quickly some biblical characteristics, and among them there is some overlap as you're going through this. But if you have the, the James River app and you click on the notes for today, it'll really help you because, honestly, I'm giving you 50-plus uh, scriptures out of the Bible, so uh, it will help you to go back and review them. The Old Testament talks about him in Daniel, and then we're going to look at what Paul says and look at Revelation Let's pick it up in Daniel chapter 7, because in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a series of visions, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9. He gets an explanation. He has another vision in chapter 10, gets an explanation that carries into chapter 11 and 12. And here's what Daniel sees. In his vision at night, I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. What is the sea? Well, verse 17 of that chapter tells us it's humanity. It's the earth coming up out of the earth, coming up out of humanity. Our four great beasts. As you read through the chapter, you find out that each one is a kingdom. Each one is a world empire. And when we think in terms of beasts, think, think in terms of something frightening. Think, think in terms of something almost like a monster, something that's not, not natural in some ways. Each different from the others came up out of the sea. And then we're introduced to the first one in verse 4. Look at it. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. You may not be familiar with Bible prophecy, but just kind of follow that back. Lion, wings, heads. The second one 
is in verse 5, and there was a second beast, a second monster, and he kind of looked like a bear. And then there was a third beast in verse 6, and he looked like a leopard, and it had four wings and had four heads. Amazing, interesting. And then there's a fourth beast. In verse 7, and after that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying, frightening, and very powerful, and it had large iron teeth. Just to give you an idea of how terrifying this is, at the end of this vision, Daniel is so weak, he is so overcome by it that he, he lays in bed. He is, he's, he's beside himself for days after this. This is a frightening vision, and it crushed and devoured its victims, and it trampled underfoot whatever was left. And it was different from all the other monsters. And it had ten horns. And while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before. This is the Antichrist. He displaces people. He, he seizes power, the Bible tells us, by intrigue, by treachery. And this horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And with that, as you make your way through Revelation, you begin, you begin to, or through Daniel, and then on through the Bible, you begin to get some characteristics of what the Antichrist will be like. I'm going to give you some here. First of all, he persecutes Christians. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints. That's people who, who are the redeemed, people who have a living faith and a living God, the true God. And he defeats them. Verse 25, the saints will be handed over to him. Watch this for a time, times, and a half time. What's a time? A time is a year. As you read Daniel, you understand that. Times is two years, and a half time is a half a year, three and a half years. Second, we learn this about him, that he rules by charm if possible and force when necessary. And the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth, and it will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. And ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, and after them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he'll subdue three kings. So he's going to come up, he's going to, he's going to charm people, but he's going to use force when necessary. The third thing we learn about him is that he changes the seasons and the dates. He, he changes the calendar. One of the things that, one of the ways to understand that is you look at our calendar and it is essentially a Judeo-Christian calendar based on, on our beliefs. You say, how so? Our week itself. Why do we have a seven-day week? Because in six days, God created the world and on the seventh day, he rested. And of all of our calendar points to the creative capacity of God and the joy of Sabbath. And then you have the dating. We date our years since the appearance of the Lord in the year of our Lord, 2017, acknowledging that he came 2017 years ago. You say, well, it was exactly, but we date, we acknowledge him. But the Antichrist comes and he changes things. Perhaps he, he gives us a four-day week or a six-day week or an eight-day week or a nine-day week and has a reason. He changes the holidays. He changes, he changes the seasons. He, he redoes everything because that is a sign of his absolute control over life. He'll speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the times, the set times, and the laws. Number four. He'll be a medium. You say, what's that mean? Rather than a large? No, he'll be a medium. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at myself. I just thought that up. He'll be a spiritist. He'll be consulting the devil. And he will be able to hear very clearly from the devil. In fact, notice it says, and understanding dark sentences, he understands occultic issues. He understands the, the energy and the machinations of the enemy. 
It's not the first world ruler who's had that. You can read books on Hitler and, and his fascination with the occult and the SS and all that was a part of that. But the Antichrist is going to take that to a whole new level. And his power shall be mighty, but watch this, but not by his own power. He's energized by a power that is definitely supernatural. A fifth thing we learn about him is he's an absolute dictator. The king will do as he pleases. Nobody stands in his way. He does exactly what he will do. Number six, he will consider himself a god, and so does the world. He'll exalt and magnify himself above every god. He will, in his own mind, be the only god, and the world will recognize it. Number seven, he'll be a blasphemer unlike any the world has seen. He'll say unheard of things. He's going to be gifted oratorically. He's going to be powerful in his words. Remember, people would say of Jesus, we didn't hear it. We've never heard anybody speak like this. The Antichrist is going to be the greatest orator, politically speaking, this world has ever seen. And he'll say unheard of things. You say, like, what? Well, it's unheard of. You've never heard it before. To say crazy things. Then we learn this. He has no respect for family, number eight. He's not bound by family love. He's not bound by tradition. Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says in the last days, and he characterizes the last days, disobedient to parents. He'll, he'll have no regard for, for family. He'll have no regard for the conventions and traditions of, of not just uh, cultures, but of humanity. This, that phrase that, or the one desired by women, we don't really know what that means. It, some uh, theorize that he is asexual, that he is, he is he's not bi, he's not homo, he's not, he's not hetero, he's, not, he's different, and has no, no leaning toward or interest in those things or respect in those things. Number nine, he is a military that's, it. That's his God. He's a, he's a military machine. He worships military might. Instead of them, he'll honor a God of fortresses. He'll honor with gold and silver, with precious stones, costly gifts. I mean, he will invest all of his resource in building a military machine capable of ruling the world unlike any military machine we've ever seen. He will use his resource to accomplish that. Number 10. Now we move into the New Testament and here Paul tells us he claims outright to be God. Paul is talking about him, and he says this. He's writing to the Thessalonians. Last week we looked at 1 Thessalonians. This is the second letter to the Thessalonians, and they were worried that they might have missed the day of the Lord. The, and, and Paul says, no, listen, there are some things that are going to happen, and one of them is that there's going to be a re great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness will be revealed, the one who brings destruction. And he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God. Abomination of desolation. Paul recognizes that, claiming that he himself is God. Paul goes on to tell us, not only will he claim deity, but he'll do the works of deity. He'll be a worker of miracles. Watch this. This man will come and do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will deceive people. When it says counterfeit, it's not like, it's not like a fake trick. It is, it is counterfeit in the sense that he's saying he's God, but it's Satan who is not a god. And it's a miracle that is not God's miracle. And he is not God. So he's acting like God, but he is doing supernatural works nonetheless. The devil can do things that are miraculous in nature or certainly are supernatural in nature. Now, let me just, let me, let me give you one more. He's from hell. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7 says, the beast comes up from the abyss. So he's from, he's from evil. He's inspired by evil. He's set up by evil. He is demonically, more than demonically, he is satanically energized. And this is the individual who's going to be ruling the world. Let me just pause here, if I can, for just a moment and 
suggest to you what is it that makes the tribulation so bad. And, and the next time we're in Mark, we're going to be talking about um, the cataclysms and the disasters because it is uh, absolutely unimaginable. You're talking, you're talking the, the Earth's population, up to two-thirds of the population dying in cataclysms. What makes the tribulation so terrible, though, and this is almost hard to say, to say, well, that's going to happen, but what makes it even worse is the fact that Satan, who now is able to be on earth, able to be in the atmosphere, able to be up in heaven. In fact, Satan is not in hell. Hell has not been open for business yet. Satan, the Bible tells us in the book of Job, periodically appears before God, and that in other parts of the Bible, he's the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses them night and day. So he's, he's standing before the Lord accusing you, accusing me. But what happens is in Revelation chapter 12, there is a battle, there is a war. When exactly this happens, we can't say with any certainty. you remember that last week I suggested to you that the suddenness and the force of the rapture, no man knows the day nor the hour, and it's this catching away that happens in a millisecond, in the, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says. Why so fast? And I suggested that very possibly that it's because this is a rescue operation. That if Satan and his forces know about it, they would try to stop it. That if they could fight it, they would. And so that as the rapture, as saints are caught up in the skies to meet the Lord and we go to heaven, that, that very possibly that initiates, that triggers a heavenly battle. Revelation chapter 12 says this, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. And he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Instantly in a moment, the universe, the heavens, vacated of his presence. Instantly in a moment, Satan and however many demons he has, if it's, if it's hundreds of millions or if it's in the billions or if it's a number, we don't know beyond that. Before allowed to go throughout creation, now confined to the earth. Not the sky, not outer space, not the heavens, the earth. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living on an earth where Satan now is confined and angry about it? Can you imagine living on an earth where there are now potentially a billion demons confined to the earth? Here he is. He is on the earth. And then in Revelation 13 and verse 1, and the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. What sea? Remember the sea of humanity. And out of the sea of humanity, I saw a beast. I saw a monster coming out of the sea. And he had, are you familiar with this? Do you remember this? Ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns and each head a blasphemous name. He is a person and he is a system. Energized by Satan, standing there as Satan watches him come forth, and he's empowered by Satan. In verse 2 of Revelation 13, the monster I saw resembled, do you remember, a leopard? And had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. In other words, he, is, he has characteristics reminiscent of previous empires and governments, but on a much different scale. He is like some of his predecessors, but different. And the biggest difference is the dragon gave the monster, the Satan gave the beast his power, his throne, and his great authority. No one's had that before. No one. Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Genghis Khan. No one's had Satan's authority and power an administrative capacity 
that this monster, this one world ruler, will have. And then, shockingly, he is assassinated and brought back to life. And one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. And the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Can you imagine if a world ruler who was beloved and exhibited all of the characteristics we have talked about in terms of charisma and oratory and prosperity was assassinated and people saw him dead and then saw him brought back to life? Can you imagine the stir that would create? And it says... The false prophet, this is one of his associates, exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf, and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He is now fully empowered by Satan. Number 15, he's not content with respect. Now he absolutely demands worship. Men worshiped the dragon because he'd given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against him? You know, who is like him? It reminds you of Exodus 15, 11. It reminds you of Psalm 35 and verse 10. Who is like our God? And he is saying, I am the God. He is unmitigated Pride and power rolled into one. The 16th thing, he is absolutely the epitome of pride and power. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words, blasphemies, to exercise his authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. And he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. You say, where do, the, where do the saints come from? I mean, what are we talking about here? The rapture, every believer, every Christian is taken to heaven to be with the Lord. But following that time, there will be people who will have heard from you and from others about the end times, about the Antichrist, about the tribulation. And people will begin reading the Bible. Be, there, there will be people who heard sermons. There will be people who heard messages who will suddenly say, oh, no. And they're going to turn to the Lord, and they're going to seek him, and they will be believers in the living God living in a world without the church, without the Holy Spirit working in the dimension that we know him today, and they will be persecuted by the Antichrist. They are people who, who are, you know, told not to worship the beast. Now back to Mark chapter 13. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down or enter his house or take anything out. You say, why would they go on their housetop? Because in that part of the world, you have patios up on the housetop. It's a, it's a way to... Uh, escape the heat. It's a way to, to uh, a patio. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it might not happen in the winter. I mean, you say, what's this talking about? It's saying, listen, when you see that happen, don't go back into the house to grab something. Don't go into back, get your coat. Don't go in to get anything you think you might need. Run. And why do we feel sorry for pregnant women? Well, have you seen a pregnant woman try to run? <laughs> and it's not easy. And what about nursing infants? Are you kidding me? It takes a minivan to carry everything you need for a nursing infant. 
mean, it'd be hard. And, and why winter? Because it's hard in winter. It's hard to run. It's hard to escape. What I want you to consider here as you look at this is something very, very interesting as you think about this. This is a, this is a huge shift theologically. The Great Commission is no longer in place. There's no longer an ab obligation to evangelize. Normally, Jesus would say, if there's persecution, stand your ground, stand firm, be bold, be courageous. Don't worry about what you're going to say because I'll speak through you. Those days are gone. Now he says, run! It's a totally different world. It's a totally different time. There is no evangelistic obligation. Mark chapter 13 and verse 19, it says this, For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, for those who are, who are followers of the living God left on the earth, whom he chose, he shortened the days. So there will be Christians living on the earth. Back to Revelation, verse 7. I, I want to just point out a couple things. The Antichrist was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. In verse 8, we read this, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast and all those whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. What's that? You see, what happens is when a person puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their name is written in a, book, in a book called the book of life. You see that book mentioned again in Revelation chapter 20 as, as the unredeemed dead are judged, and it says they're all standing before this great throne, and the books are opened, and everyone is judged. This is not for believers. This is for unbelievers. Everybody judged according to the things that they had done as was recorded in the books, every word every action, you have to give an account for it. And then it says that there was the book of life, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, it's almost like God is saying, I want to make sure I haven't missed anybody. And if their name was not found written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Here you have the book of life. It's saying true believers will not worship the Antichrist. In verse 15, we read this, and he caused all who refused to worship the image of the beast to be killed. In other words, there is a death warrant on those who refuse to worship the beast. It will be very, very hard to live for God in that time. It's interesting in verse 9, the next verse, it says this, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Listen up. But that phrase is different than you find earlier in the book of Revelation. Earlier when the church is on the earth, it says, he who has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, let him hear. But there's no church, so it's not mentioned. The church is gone. And there's no Spirit speaking to people in the way the Spirit. We're living in a season, a time, since the day of Pentecost to our own day where the Spirit of God is working in a unique way. It will, many assume, revert back to a time like the Old Testament period when people, righteous people, could believe in God, but it was different than it is in, in this day, this season. The Spirit is no longer speaking in the same way. The church is no longer there. What, what, what should you hear if you're left behind? What, what should you understand? Verse 10, look at this. Very interesting. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he'll go. We've got a lot of militant Christians who are like ready to pick up a gun at, at the first sign of anything. And I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not sure that's, that's where Jesus is at. But in the, in the end times, he's giving you this advice. When there's Antichrist and there's you, you don't fight him. If you're destined for prison, go to prison. If you're destined to be killed, be killed. 
And this calls for patient endurance. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to endure and faithfulness on the part of God's saints. In other words, he's there. You just have to accept the providence and work of God. If you're in prison, you're in prison. If you are killed, you are killed. And then we read on in verse 16. It says this, and he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, those on the grid and those off the grid, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead. You, you, you say, what is that mark? I have no idea. I don't know that it's, people say, well, is it a chip? Is it a numeric thumbprint? Is it DNA? Who knows? Let me say this. I think you will know exactly what the mark is if you happen, heaven forbid, to be there in that day and be confronted with that choice of either worshiping him, receiving his mark, or not. No one by accident is going to get the mark and say, well, I didn't, know, I didn't know what I was getting into here. Remember back, I read accounts of when Social Security was brought about that, that people were like, that's, that's the mark of the beast. But now you're drawing benefits and loving it. So, <laughs> so no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. In Revelation chapter 14, it says this in verse 9, And a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives his mark on forehead or on hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. You know what? It may very well be possible that people will be warned not by intuition and not by reading the Bible, but by an angel flying through midair. This is a different time. This is a different moment in creation and in history. Warning people, don't do it. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There's no rest day or night for those who worship the beast or his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Watch this. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Same thing we just read in the previous chapter. All of this, you say, where, where's this leading? Two things. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus said, the Son of Man comes at an hour. You think not. He is coming soon. Are you ready? Are you ready if he comes? Are you going to be raptured? Are you going to be? You say, well, I'm just not sure. I wouldn't want to be there. Are you ready? You say, how do I get ready? Are, are you, is there a moment that you've been born again? Is there a moment that you put your faith in Christ? Is there a moment that you said, I believe you died for my sin and that you are the king and I'm going to commit my life to following you, believing you and in you only is there forgiveness. Have you done that? If you have not, then you're not ready. Or are, is it possible that you are a person who would say, you know, yes, John, there was a time and there was a place, but today you've come into this place and you know you're not right with God. And for some, that's not a, a matter of a week. That's a matter of a lifestyle of living apart from his goodness and his grace. And you remember a time when things were better for you spiritually and you've come today. And my, my advice to you is you, you need to rededicate your heart. You need to make sure you're right with him because he's coming soon. Second, is there somebody that you need to tell? Is there somebody, right now, we, the, the Great Commission is in full effect. Right now, we have an evangelistic obligation to share the gospel with people around us. Is there somebody that you need to talk to about the Lord? Are there family members? Are there friends? Are there neighbors? Are there coworkers? Are there people that you meet that need to hear the good news about a God who loves them more than they can imagine, who can change them and bring his life-giving power into to their heart first and from the inside out change everything around them? If you knew the rapture were coming this afternoon at 5 o'clock, who would you call? What would you say? And my encouragement to you, and I believe the encouragement of the Holy Spirit is, then don't delay, do it now. 
because he's coming soon. There will be the rapture. This gospel will be preached to all the earth, and then the end will come. Those are the words of Jesus. And the very next thing that you find him talking about is the devastating, demonic, horrific period of time known as the Great Tribulation. And in God's love, in his justice, he will pour out judgment on the earth. In his love, he would that no one be there. And so today, he presents us with truth that you and I might flee the coming judgment. Amen? Let's pray.